Thank you, Eventide, and thank you, Jason, for all your help and work over there in the sound booth this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the uh, book of 1 John. First John, we'll read the uh, fourth, begin with the fourth chapter, or the, the fourth chapter of First John, and we'll begin looking at the seventh verse of that chapter. First John 4. The Apostle Paul writes, or I'm sorry, the Apostle John writes, and he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. I want you to notice a couple words there in that ninth verse of 1 John 4. By this the love of God was manifested. Your translations may say commended or shown or whatever. In us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, into the world, so that we might live through Him. Today, I want to conclude my Lenten series on Calvary as the pinnacle of various things. I've preached for the last uh, five weeks on uh, the pinnacle of Calvary and how Calvary is the pinnacle of a lot of things in God's plan. I want to look today, as I conclude this series, on Calvary as the pinnacle of love. When you look at it, Calvary is a great love story. It's the, it's the most wonderful love story, isn't it, when you look at the cross. It's hard to believe that the cross is a love story, but that's exactly what it is. As I was studying for this sermon, I thought to myself, what are some great love stories out there? You probably got your own love story, of course, but... Uh, I got to thinking, what are some great love stories out there? And I, I was able to research a few. First of all, Romeo and Juliet. That's, that's probably the, the, in history and literature, that's probably the quintessential love story of all time. When you think about a, a love story, the first thing that comes to your mind is, a lot of times, is Romeo and Juliet. The Capulets and the Montagues, they were two feuding families, and, and these young, this young couple was... Uh, each one was from one of those different feuding families. And these families, of course, did not want Romeo and Juliet to marry. And you know the story about how they uh, committed suicide because they couldn't be with each other. So the story of Shakespeare by Romeo and Juliet probably is uh, up there as, uh, as one of the most favorite of all love stories. There's the, the love story of Paris and, and Helen of Troy when you read about that. Uh, that caused a war. A lot of times when couples get together, a war starts, but uh, in this uh, situation, it did. Paris and Helen of Troy, it was the cause of the Trojan War and all that that came about about the Trojan horse, and you know all of that. You can read that in, in the Iliad. Joseph and Napoleon was a tremendous love story. Probably one of my favorites was the uh, love story of Odysseus and Penelope in the, uh, in the Odyssey. You probably know that story about how Odysseus goes off to fight in the Trojan War, and uh, on the way back, uh, the gods were sort of mad at Odysseus, and it took him 10 years to get back to Penelope, and Penelope waited for him for all of those 10 years. Who can forget the love story between Scarlett O'Hara and Red Butler uh, in Gone with the Wind? Frankly, my dear, well, you know what, all that about that story. Scarlett O'Hara and, and Red Butler. Edward VIII was, a, was in line for the throne of Great Britain to be king, and he abdicated the throne. He gave up the throne to marry a commoner, a common woman. He met her in, in uh, the United States, and her name was Wallace Simpson in, of Baltimore. And King Edward VIII, he was entitled to the throne of England, and he gave it up to marry Wallace Simpson. Darcy and Elizabeth, you probably remember that in Pride and Prejudice, Pocahontas and John Smith, these are all tremendous love stories. Guinevere and Sir Lancelot, uh, love stories in history and literature. And probably my favorite of them all, Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy. <laughs> all of these stories, of course, have their place in human history and in, in the human hearts. 
Uh, but none of these love stories, of course, can compare to the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it, it was the apex, the climax of, of the pinnacle of all love stories. There is no love story greater than the cross of Calvary. It would be the greatest love story. It's the greatest love story, love story as long as time has begun, and it will be the greatest love story until the end of time, that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die on Calvary. Why, why would we say that Calvary is the pinnacle of love? Four reasons I want to look at this morning why I believe that Calvary is the pinnacle of love. Like our text said this morning in 1 John, Calvary was the pinnacle of love because it was manifested love. It was manifested love. When we look at our text, John the Apostle uh, tells us that Jesus, he, John of course observed the life of Jesus. He knew Jesus. He understood Jesus. He was with Jesus a lot. And John concluded after all of that that Jesus was all about love. Christ was all about love. In verse 9 of our text, it says that, John, that God manifested his love to us by sending his only begotten son. God's love on Calvary is a manifested love. Now, the word manifested means to become visible or to become known or, or to become revealed. Calvary is the pinnacle of love because God on Calvary manifested himself or God on Calvary revealed himself to the world. It was a revelation of God. When you love somebody, you want that person to know you, don't you? When you love somebody, you want to reveal yourself to that person. You want to manifest yourself to that person. You want to be known to that person. When you love somebody, you want to be known by them. You want that person to know everything about you. That person knows some things about you that nobody else does. So you reveal yourself to them. And when you love somebody, you want that person to know you. You want to reveal yourself to them. You want to tell yourself about that person. When you love somebody, you're not going to hold back. When you love somebody, you're not going to hold back, but you're going to work to reveal yourself, to manifest yourself, to make yourself known to that person, no matter what those things may be. We know these things. You know these things about your husbands or about your wives. You know these things, and you don't have to look these things up on Google. Your husbands and your wives has revealed these things to you because they want you to know them, and you want them to be known by you. You can say these things to them to show them how much you love them, and you just want them to know all these things about you. That's what manifested means. And that's what the Bible teaches us that God did on Calvary. God revealed himself. God made himself known in a self-revelation or a manifestation to, to mankind. This is the pinnacle of greatness of all things because the greatest of all beings, the great and the mighty God, revealed himself, manifested himself to us on Calvary. On Calvary, God says, I want you to know me. I want you to know all about me. I want to reveal myself to you. I want you to know that I am a God of mercy. I want you to know that I am a God of love. I want you to know that I am a God of grace. I want you to know that I am a God of forgiveness. When we see Calvary, God is saying, I want you to know me. As you love somebody, you want that person to know you. And God wants us to know him. God wants us to know that each one of us are important enough to God for God to die for us. God wants us to know that he loves us. And God wants us to know that he re has revealed himself by saying those beautiful words, God is love. God has revealed himself and wants us to know that Christ is the only path to salvation. The cross is the only path to salvation. God wanted us to know and wants us to know that the death of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. 
God manifested himself. We do not have to, uh, we do not have to question God. We don't have to uh, try to figure out God. Of course, there's things about God that we'll never know and we'll understand. But God has revealed and manifested himself to us on Calvary. The second thing about Christ, about the love of God, that uh, I believe it's a pinnacle of love, is because it is an unlimited love. It is an unlimited love. God's love has no limits. And we cannot place limits on God's love. The Bible says in our text that John says that Jesus came into the world. Jesus didn't come to Jews. Jesus just didn't come to uh, people, other people there. Jesus came to the world, the Bible says. Jesus just did not come to Jews. Jesus just didn't come to Americans. He just didn't come to the Spanish people. He just didn't come to the, to the European people. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to the world. And he also says that many should live through him. We, meaning all people, and in all places, and in all times. God's love on Calvary was the pinnacle of love. It was the climax of love. It was the highest point of love because no one, no one is excluded. Nobody is excluded from the love of God. The Bible says, whosoever, who is that? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. For the love of God is for everyone. God's love is unlimited. Paul writes in Ephesians, the third chapter, the 17th through the 19th verse, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. That is unlimited love. To know that God loves us and the love of God has no limits. It has no breadth. It has no length. It has no height. It has no depth. The love of God is unlimited. I like that great song and Eventide sang it a few weeks ago. It said that if every person on the earth were a scribe, and every, uh, and every one of us had uh, a quill and, and, and the sky was parchment, and the ocean was ink, then we would drain the oceans dry trying to write the love of God. We would drain the oceans dry, and after we had drained all the oceans dry, there would still be more of the love of God to write. God is love, and nobody is excluded from His love. God loves every member of ISIS. He does. God loves every member of ISIS. We limit God's love, but He doesn't. God loves every member of Al Qaeda. God loves every terrorist. God loves every homosexual. God loves every Democrat. <laughs> God loves every Republican. God loves every Pentecostal. God loves every evolutionary scientist that believe we sprang from monkeys. He loves them all. God loves every drunk out there. Every homeless person at CARM today, God loves them. Every deadbeat mom, every deadbeat dad, God loves them. Every, 
heroin addicted young mother that aborts her baby, God loves them. God loves you. God loves me. His love is unlimited. We put limits on God's love, don't we? We put the limits out there. But God loves them all. As Revelation says, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. God loves them all. So many times our love is limited, isn't it? We, we, we like to love those who love us. We like to love those that look like us and act like us and, and maybe the same color. We like to lo uh, love those people that are on the same social scale that we're on. We like to love those people that, that are, are in our inner circle. And if they're out of our inner circle, then we don't love them. That, that's not what the Bible teaches us about God. God's love is unlimited. When God died on the cross, when Christ died on the cross, that love was for everybody. Some of the greatest believers, I believe, in the world, some of the greatest believers in the world are those that have come to the conclusion that they were unlovable, but God still loved them. You look through history, some of our greatest Christians are those who at one time felt that they were unlovable and they realized that God loved them. Look at John Newton. John Newton was the, was the a captain of a slave ship and, and uh, a clap, captain of a slave ship. We, have, we cannot even begin to comprehend how awful and how terrible and how uh, nefarious it was for uh, the slaves to be brought over in those crowded uh, slave ships and uh, not given any food, not given the opportunity to go to the bathroom, not, uh, not to be touched, uh, helped if they were sick and down in the holds of those ships and, and they would bring those ships over here and uh, and enslave those people and John Newton was one of the he was a captain of one of those ships and when he got saved he realized how he realized how despicable he was he realized how terrible he was and how much the grace of God had saved him and he wrote that beautiful song amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me that is the love of God it is unlimited. Calvary is the pinnacle of God's love because that love is unlimited. It knows no bounds. The, the love of Calvary, I believe, is also a pinnacle of love because it is a demonstrated love. It's a demonstrated love. Paul writes in the fifth chapter, Romans, the eighth verse, he says, but God demonstrates his love to us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Calvary is the pinnacle of the love of God because on Calvary, God has demonstrated His love for us. We see God's power demonstrated a lot of ways, don't we? We, we, we see a rose out there. Go out and look at a rose when they bloom and, and, and we see the power of God in a rose. Last night I went out, I don't know if you saw the sky last night, but it's absolutely beautiful with, with the uh, first quarter moon hanging up there and the planet Jupiter hanging right beside it and by the great constellation or Orion. It was a, a beautiful sight in our sky last night. And, and the sky demonstrates the power of God. When you hold a little puppy in your hand, that little puppy demonstrates the power of God through nature. But on Calvary, we see God demonstrate his love we see God demonstrating his power and we see God demonstrating his blood uh, his love and we see the blood of Christ and we realize this is a demonstration of the love of God love is not love until it is commended or demonstrated I wouldn't give you two hoots and a holler for a love that is not demonstrated when you love somebody you want to demonstrate that love you want to demonstrate it. You may say things. You may buy things. You may do things. You may not do some things. But you do many different things for the one that you love. Why? Because you love that one and you want to show it. You want to demonstrate that love to that person. And when you demonstrate your love to that person, you are saying to that person, I love you. 
I like a good bowl of soup beans, especially with little bits of ham in it. Love a good bowl of soup beans, as many of you know. But every time I went home, when I went home into the cater, and a lot of homes, time when I went home to my mom over here in Dover, mom always had a pot of soup beans on for me. Always had a pot of soup beans and cornbread. And why did she do that? She didn't do that because she thought, my son is so skinny and puny, i got to feed that boy, put some meat on his bone. My mom did that because she loved me. And those soup beans and that little pieces of ham in it and, those, and, and that good cornbread, those, that, that, those soup beans was a demonstration of her love to me. She was saying by fixing those soup beans, Lee, I love you. And many times when I would go home on a trip or I would come home, as soon as I walked in the door, I would smell the soup beans. And I know, I would know that my mom loved me. Those were a demonstration of her love. You love people and you demonstrate it. You show people that you love it by demonstrating. You show your children how much you love them by demonstrating, by buying things for them, by being there with them at their ball games, by helping them along the way. You demonstrate to your children how much you love them by doing things for them. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, of the story by O. Henry. By, and the title of the story was The, the Gift of the Magi. You've ever heard of the gift of the Magi? It's a wonderful story, sort of a Christmas story, but, but uh, it's, it's a story that has a message uh, that, that goes beyond Christmas, of, cor of course. There was this guy by the name, by his, uh, they, they called him Young Jim, and he, and he had his wife, wife Della. And they were poor, and they, they lived in a modest apartment, and, and uh, uh, they, have, they had only two possessions that they took pride in. Della had real long, beautiful hair. And Jim loved Della's long hair. And, and Jim had a pocket watch, which is father's and his grandfather's. But he didn't have a fob to that watch, but he just had the watch. So on Christmas Eve, with a dollar and 87 cents in her hand... Uh, she, uh, Della wanted to buy a gift for Jim, and she couldn't buy a fob for a dollar and 87 cents. So she goes out, and she cuts her beautiful long hair, and she sells this beautiful long hair for $20. She takes that $20, and she buys a beautiful watch fob for Jim. She goes home, and she's so excited because when Bob comes, or when Jim comes home, she's going to buy that, give him that watch fob. Well, Jim does come home, and as soon as he sees Della with her hair totally cut, just real short hair, her, his face drops. His face drops. And Della says, Jim, I've got a gift for you. I want to give it to you. And it was a beautiful watch fob for his watch. And Jim just sat down on the couch, held Della close to her and said, this is what I got you for Christmas. And he bought her some beautiful, expensive hair combs for her long hair. Jim had no watch because he sold his watch to buy the combs for her hair. So Della had no hair. Jim had no watch. And the end of the story goes, says, although Jim and Della are now, are now left with gifts that neither one of them can use, they realize, and this is important, they realize how far they are willing to go to show their love to each other. And that's what the cross is for us today. God is willing to go to the cross through His Son, Jesus Christ, to show us how much He loves us. Love is not love until it is demonstrated. And Calvary is the pinnacle of love because Jesus on the cross is the greatest demonstration of love throughout all history and the greatest demonstration of love that will ever be. Finally, this morning, it is a pinnacle of love because it was a sacrificial love. When you love someone, you're not selfish to that person. True love is not selfish. True love is selfless. You give yourself to the person that you love. 
Calvary was the pinnacle of love because of who was sacrificed there. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was sacrificed on the cross for us. He gave himself. He died for us. He sacrificed himself for us when he died on the cross. And that is the greatest pinnacle of love. Husbands sacrificed for their wives and wives sacrificed for their husbands. Parents sacrificed for their children. Children sacrificed for their elderly parents. Grandparents sacrificed for their grandchildren. Love is only love when it is a love that is sacrificial. When you must give up something to show that person that you love them. That is a sacrificial love. And the pinnacle of that sacrificial love was the death of Christ on the cross. Isaiah writes in that wonderful chapter, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the 5th verse, he says, Christ died for us. Christ died on our behalf. Christ died instead of us. Christ died for our sake. And Isaiah says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The the chastisement of our peace fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That is sacrificial to love. Love today. Love is only love when it is a love that is based in the sacrifice of the lover. The cross of Calvary. We've looked at it all during this Lenten time. We've looked at it all during this Lenten time. And we realize that the cross is the pinnacle of God's revelation. We must keep ourselves near the cross. We must keep the cross before us. We must keep the cross in our hearts. We must keep the cross in our desires. We must keep the cross in our lives. Because the cross says to us how much He loves us. The pinnacle of God's love is the cross of Calvary. Oh, how he loves you and me. Isn't that a wonderful song? Isn't that a wonderful statement today? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Father, we thank you for the death of your son on the cross.